Welcome to the University of Michigan Dentistry Podcast Series, promoting oral health care worldwide. It is necessary for all aspects of dentistry to understand the relationship between the patterns of mandibular movement and occlusal form. Occlusal morphology, cusp height and placement, ridge and groove placement and direction should be compatible with function and parafunction. However, restoration of occlusion is not indicated just because the occlusal morphology does not fit with some preconceived ideal form. If a patient requires restorations, one should not ignore the relationship between the occlusal and mandibular movements. Each patient has an individual characteristics that determine his occlusal needs. These characteristics come from the anatomical features of the temporal mandibular joints and the spatial relationship of the teeth to the joints. Therefore, the temporal mandibular joints provide the guidance mechanism for mandibular movements and the teeth function within these limits. Teeth and joints in conflict can result in temporal mandibular joint or muscle dysfunction. Mandibular movements involve rotation and translation of the condyles in three planes. The mandible is capable of making simple rotary movements such as in opening and closing, and they also involve translatory movements such as the condyle moving in a working and balancing movement. We have these movements simultaneously in the three planes. We have movement in the horizontal plane. These would be the lateral movements in the horizontal plane. We have lateral movements in the sagittal plane. And we also have movements in the frontal plane. Movements in the different planes influence the ridge and groove direction of the teeth. If you will observe the teeth, we, the teeth are made up of cusps, and we have in here grooves, and we have ridges on the teeth. The movements in the different planes influence the ridge and groove direction and the placement of the cusp and the cusp height. These movements also influence the lingual concavities of the maxillary anterior teeth. In the movements, the inci lower incisor teeth move against the lingual surfaces of the upper anterior teeth. And these movements influence the lingual concavities of the anterior teeth. There are certain anatomical features or morphological features of the teeth because of their position in the jaws and also the relationship of the cusps. If we can observe the way these teeth are oriented in the jaw, this is a model of an upper uh, jaw, and we notice in here the teeth, we have the cusp tips, these are the buccal cusp tips of the upper teeth, and you will notice that they are shorter than the lingual cusps of the upper teeth. The lingual cusps, which are your supporting cusps, are longer than the buccal cusps, which are your non-supporting cusps. And this is possible because in the balancing movement, the, working con or the balancing condyle comes down the condylar eminence and separates the teeth further. This gives us a curve that goes across the arch, or a curve of Monson, or a curve of Wilson, as it's been called. So we have a buccal and lingual curve to the teeth. This same situation would occur on the mandibular teeth. If you notice here again that the um, buccal cusps, which are your supporting cusps on the lower teeth, are a little bit higher than the lingual cusps of your mandibular teeth, which are a little bit shorter. And this, again, would give you the curvature, the curve of Wilson that we have on our teeth. 
We also could note that the ridge and groove direction and the cusp height is different from the second molar as we come forward to the bicuspid. The cusp height, the anatomical uh, features of the teeth are more distinct and sharper, steeper on the bicuspids than they are on the molars. The uh, ridge and groove direction is different from the molars than it is to the bicuspid teeth, and this will be the reasons for this will be explained in the remainder of the film. Some restorations cannot be made directly in the mouth and must be made indirectly on a simulator of mandibular movements and articulator. Articulators range from the simple opening and closing type to the more complex type that can be modified to match the patient's individual characteristics. Because a simple articulator does not account for individual differences, the restored occlusal morphology must be corrected in the mouth by an occlusal adjustment procedure. The extent of occlusal adjustment required to make the occlusal morphology compatible with the patient's individual functional movements depends on the accuracy of the recording of the determinants of occlusal morphology and the ability of the articulator to simulate these determinants. Mandibular movements in three planes results in a complex interplay of movements which explains the controversies that exist in occlusion and the existence of conflicting theories of occlusion. The determinants of occlusal morphology apply to all aspects of dentistry. Occlusal adjustment, orthodontics, operative, crown and bridge, partial dentures, and complete dentures. As was pointed out in previous lectures, there is a need for different occlusal concept when natural teeth are involved and when a denture is involved. Balanced occlusion may be indicated in complete dentures, whereas Balanced occlusion is not indicated for natural teeth. The determinants of occlusal morphology can be used differently to accomplish a balanced occlusion or clearance between teeth in function. Some of the determinants of occlusal morphology can be changed. However, the determinants from the temporomandibular joint cannot be changed by the dentist. The functional movements involved are speaking, swallowing, chewing and parafunctional movements such as clenching and bruxing. In chewing, the individual uses the anterior teeth to incise the food and the posterior teeth to chew the food. One side of the mouth is used for chewing. This is the working side. While the opposite side may be in a balancing contact as in indenture occlusion or in idling with no contacts as in the natural teeth. If you notice the side that the, uh, the patient is chewing the gum on is the working side. These teeth pass in near contact and give us the function or the efficiency of chewing. The opposite side is termed the balancing if it's a denture to where you would have contacts that would keep that side of the denture in place while the patient chews. Or in the natural teeth, we would turn this the idling side because we don't want contact on the balance on the opposite side as the working side. So that side, the teeth are idling while the opposite teeth are functioning. For the sake of simplicity of the complex movements in three planes, each plane will be discussed separately. The determinants of occlusal morphology in each plane will be demonstrated and the effect on the cusp height, ridge and groove direction, and the lingual concavities of the anterior teeth will be shown.
we will first examine the horizontal plane determinants. In the horizontal plane, the movements that we will be concerned with are the working and balancing movements. In the working and balancing movements, the condyle on the one side in the balancing movement comes downward, forward, and inward. In the next movement, it will come in a pure rotation. If we view the schematic drawing of the maxilla and the mandible in the horizontal plane, we can determine the effects of the movements in the horizontal plane on the ridge and groove direction. These effects may be due to either geometric factors or anatomic factors. The geometric factors involved are first, pure rotation. In lateral movement, we find that the rotation occurs around the working condyle, which rotates, and the balancing condyle comes forward, inward, and downward. And this would be a working movement, where the teeth on this side would be in a working movement, and the teeth on this side would be in a balancing movement. So we will observe this side, and this is the movement of the teeth in a working movement. And the effect that this rotation, just pure rotation of the working side, has on the ridge and groove direction. We notice that the mandible moves and the maxilla stays still. On this drawing, we can observe the effects of the cusp and the occlusal surfaces. The red lines represent the path of movements of the mandibular cusp against the stationary maxillary occlusal surface. The blue lines represent the path of the stationary maxillary cusp against the moving mandibular surface. These are the working paths. In the balancing movement, Observe this side again. You would find that the opposite condyle now is the rotating condyle, and this condyle would come downward, forward, and inward to give us our balancing movement. The broken blue lines represent the paths of the stationary maxillary cusp against the moving mandibular occlusal surface in the balancing movement. The broken red lines represent the path of movement of the mandibular cusp in the balancing movement against the stationary maxillary occlusal surface. These movements form an arrow. The arrows on the maxillary arch point into the mouth. The arrow formed by the working and balancing movement on the mandibular arch point out of the mouth. The second geometric factor in the horizontal plane that would involve the ridge and groove direction and also the lingual concavity of the maxillary anterior teeth would be the intercondylar distance, the distance between the condyle heads. 
For each patient, this would be different. If we assume we have a hypothetical patient in this situation, which has an intercondylar distance of 90 millimeters. Let's supposing that we make a restoration now, as we have on this small articulator, and we see that now we have an intercondylar distance here of about 40 millimeters. And we go ahead and make a crown on that restoration. So we now have an intercondylar distance of 40 millimeters. If we, say, make this same restoration on the Hanau articulator, the Hanau articulator has a fixed intercondylar distance, and this intercondylar distance is 110 millimeters. We can see here that the, fixed, the intercondylar distance is fixed, and this is fixed at 110 millimeters. If we made a restoration on that, this would be wider than the patient's head. The small articulator would be smaller than the patient's head. There are articulators that are, have adjustments so that we can vary the intercondylar distance. This is an articulator where it has adjustments where you can make the intercondylar distance of the articulator wider or narrower to match the patient's head. If we see the effect now of the difference in the intercondylar distance, we can see the effect of the narrower and the wider intercondylar distance in the patient's head. If we made the restoration on the small articulator, which is 40 millimeters wide, this would cause the ridge and groove direction to be formed more towards the distal on the upper teeth. This would be the uh, balancing movement and this would be the working movement. On the mandibular teeth, it would be formed more towards the mesial. So if we put the restoration back in the mouth, we'd have interference between this area, these areas. This is the line or the path of movement that the cusp would make in the patient's mouth. Now, if we made it on the Hanau articulator, where the intercondylar distance is wider than the patient's head, we would have the grooves farming on the upper teeth, more towards the distal, and on the mandibular teeth, more, toward, or more towards the mesial on the upper teeth, and more towards the distal on the mandibular teeth. So in reality, again, we'd have interferences between these areas, more towards the distal on the mandibular teeth, and interferences towards the mesial inclines on the maxillary teeth. The effect on the lingual surfaces of the maxillary anterior teeth can be shown in this diagram. The wider the intercondylar distance, the more lingual concavity we would need in the lingual surfaces of the anterior teeth, whereas the narrower the intercondylar distance, the less lingual concavity required in the lingual surfaces of the upper anterior teeth. The third geometric factor that can affect the ridge and groove direction in the horizontal plane is the facial position of the teeth. In most mouths, we would find that the teeth are either closer or further apart uh, away from the rotating centers. As we see in this case, these teeth are closer to this rotating center than the teeth on this side. These teeth are further away from the rotating center. This has an effect on the ridge and groove direction. Also, the bicuspids here are further away from the rotating center than the molars. So this would have effect on the ridge and groove direction. Also, a tooth or teeth may be closer to the midline on one side than they are on the other. Now, if we look at the patient's head, we would find that the teeth have a certain relationship to the rotating centers. And this we should transfer over to the articulator. And this we can do with the face bow, or this was what we attempt to do with the face bow. You notice on the face bow transfer, we have our bite registration for our maxillary cast. You will notice here that the, this, these teeth are closer to this condyle than they are to this condyle. And we want to transfer this relationship over to the articulator. Also, you can see here that the 
upper teeth may be higher on one side than they are on the other, and this we transfer over to our articulator. Now if we use the simple articulator again, a couple of things are wrong here, is that we, first of all, we have the cast in the center of the articulator, whereas in the head it had a certain relationship to the condyle, so that this restoration now is not in the exact axis or radius as it is in the head, so the ridges and grooves directions that we form on here will be in error, and they will have to be corrected as we go back to the head. Let's observe the effects of the facial position of the teeth on the ridge and groove direction. If this is the position of the tooth in the patient's head, and these are the angles, this is the working movement and the balancing movement that that patient would move with uh, in the working and balancing movement. The restoration that we made on this articulator, the fact that it is in the center of the articulator and it is the same distance from the uh, condyles on the articulator and it's a shorter distance than it is in the patient's head, we would have the ridge and groove direction designed in this area. So that when we put it back in the mouth, this area would be in error or interference. We'd have to adjust all of this area in the mouth. Another thing that uh, the facial position causes a difference in the ridge and groove direction due to the fact, as we said, that it is further away from the condyles in the bicuspid area than it is in the molar area. As we can see here, the ridge and groove direction, the angle between the working and balancing would be more acute in the molar area and more obtuse in the bicuspid area. The first of the anatomical factors that affect the ridge and groove direction in the horizontal plane is the side shift to the mandible. The side shift of the mandible has to do with the relationship of the lateral walls or the lateral portion of the condyle against the lateral walls of the condylar fossa. If we have no side shift, as represented by the green line, we would have a certain ridge and groove direction, and then if we increase the side shift, as we have in the red line, we would have a different ridge and groove direction. This is the pattern that the mandible would follow if there were very little or no side shift to the mandible. If there was a side shift, the condyle would move laterally more as it would move downward, forward, and inward. The effect that this would have on the ridge and groove direction can be shown in this diagram from the textbook. Here we have the situation with no side shift in A, and this would be represented by the line A in the working and balancing movements. If we had increased the side shift as represented by C, this would be the line represented by that movement. As we see here, we have this immediate side shift, and then the condyle moves downward, forward, and inward. So this would give us a wider area in the central portion, just as we came out of centric. This would represent a very distributed type of a side shift, where they would be evenly distributed throughout the movement. This also has an effect on the anterior teeth. If we had a very slight amount of side shift, as we have here in A, we have very little side shift. This would be represented by this. If we increase the side shift, we would also have to increase the lingual concavity of the maxillary anterior teeth. So the more side shift we have, the more lingual concavity we would have to have in the lingual con surfaces of the anterior teeth. The working condyle movement in the horizontal plane has an effect on the ridge and groove direction and also on the lingual surfaces of the anterior teeth. The working condyle can not only rotate, but it can move laterally, 
and it can move laterally, straight laterally, laterally and forward, or laterally and back, as is represented by these three colored lines here. If it moved along the green line, it would be moving straight laterally. If it moved along the red line, it would be moving laterally and forward. If it moved along the blue line, it would be moving laterally and back, and this would have an effect on the ridge and groove direction. In a straight lateral movement, the working condyle would move in a straight lateral direction. In a lateral forward movement, the working condyle would move laterally and forward. And in the, straight, in the lateral and posterior movement, the condyle would move laterally and back. In this diagram from the textbook again, we can see the effect that the movement of the working condyle would have on the ridge and groove direction. Here we have the condyle would move laterally, straight laterally, laterally and protrusive, and laterally and in retrusive. And this would have the speedy effect on the working and balancing movements and on the upper and the lower teeth. We can see here that if the condyle moved laterally and protrusive, it would tend to move the grooves more to the distal on the lower. As it would move laterally and retrusive, it would move it more towards the mesial on the lower. The reverse would be true on the maxillary. As we went laterally and retrusive, it would move it more towards the distal. And lateral protrusive would move towards the mesial. The lingual surface of the anterior teeth are also affected as the condyle moves laterally and, and in protrusive. It would cause or require more lingual concavity of the lingual surfaces of the anterior teeth. So as you go laterally and forward, you need more concavity on the anterior teeth. If we had a condyle that was moving laterally and in retrusive or laterally and back, this would move away from the lingual surfaces of the anterior teeth and this would cause less or require less lingual concavity. The sagittal plane determinants can be observed by looking at the side of the head. The protrusive movement is made by pushing the jaw forward and back In the protrusive movement, the anterior teeth come in contact, and as the mandible moves forward, the anterior teeth and the condyles and the condylar eminence should clear the posterior teeth. In a non-balanced occlusion for natural teeth, the posterior teeth should not contact when the patient goes into a protrusive movement. When the patient bites on the front teeth to incise, then the posterior teeth should not be in contact. If we look at the skull, here we can see the condylar area. The condyle rides on the disc. The disc is in contact with the bone. And as we slide the jaw forward, the condyle comes down the disc and down the eminence. The anterior teeth ride against the lingual surfaces of the upper anterior teeth and act as our anterior guidance. And this causes a separation of the teeth. The condyles coming down the eminence and the lower incisors coming down the lingual surfaces of the upper anterior teeth causes a separation of the posterior teeth. In the natural dentition, we don't want the posterior teeth to contact in the protrusive movement. If we look at the protrusive movement in a schematic diagram, we find again that the anterior teeth and the condylar inclination separates the posterior teeth. In the sagittal plane, we have three variables that we are concerned with, and these variables can affect the cusp height of the posterior teeth, 
and also the lingual concavity of the upper anterior teeth. These variables are the condylar inclination, the plane of occlusion in the posterior teeth, it's a plane of occlusion, the curve of speed, the cusp angle, and the cusp height. The anterior teeth, it's the amount of overlap of the anterior teeth. If we look at this formula that I'm sure you've seen before for balanced occlusion, we would find that these variables in the horizontal or in the sagittal plane uh, have some effect on each other. If we assume that balanced occlusion is accomplished by uh, a combination of condylar guidance, which is CG, and incisal guidance, which is IC, then if we change these, we affect the cusp angle the curve of speed and the plane of occlusion. So that these, there is an interaction between these variables. Now in the natural teeth, we do not want to have a balanced occlusion on the posterior teeth. So we would want to modify these variables to get us, get our clearance of the posterior teeth. Now if we look at the first variable, the difference in the condylar inclination or the effect of the condylar inclination, if we have a normal condylar path, which is represented by the red condylar path, and we make a protrusive movement using this, we find that the posterior teeth should clear. Now, if we use a steeper, or the patient has a steeper condylar inclination, such as in the green path, this means that we can put in a steeper cusp, or the cusp angle can be steeper. If we have a shallower condylar inclination, we would find that we would have to shorten the posterior teeth because they would clash in a shallower condylar inclination. If the resultant path of the movement of the condyle on the patient were curved, and the articulator, which most articulators are, are the condylar inclination would be straight, then we would follow a path such as this on the articulator, and it would give us a lesser condylar inclination. If we put it back to the mouth and the patient followed a curved path, it would separate the posterior teeth more and give us more clearance on the posterior teeth. However, if we were going to balance the occlusion to where in protrusive the posterior teeth are to contact, this curvature of the condylar path could be significant. The condylar inclination can also affect the lingual concavity of the maxillary anterior teeth. The lingual concavity of the anterior teeth is the area we're talking about here of the upper anterior teeth. This is where the lower anterior teeth, the incisal edges, guide across these surfaces for our incisal guidance. Now the steeper the condylar inclination, the steeper or the, shallow, or the um, shallower the condylar lingual concavity can be. The shallower the condylar path, the more concavity we must have in the lingual surfaces of the upper anterior teeth. Some clinical applications of these principles can be demonstrated in some actual clinical work that is being done. This articulator is in your instrument kit and you will be using this for uh, certain phases of your restorative dentistry. You notice here we're making a crown for a patient on this, these models and this articulator. Now if you will notice there is no condylar path or no provisions on this articulator for uh, the condylar inclination. So if we were to err in the movements of this, see this just moves by the springs, we could have errors incorporated in the crown so that when we went back to the mouth, instead of giving clearance, these might uh, cause interferences. So if a crown was to make, be made on this articulator and placed in the mouth, we would have to do an occlusal adjustment in the protrusive movement for the clearance. Now, the other articulator that we use is the uh, Hanau articulator. And here, we have provisions uh, 
for a change or a difference in the condylar inclination. We would take a protrusive check bite and set the condylar inclination so that it would be uh, somewhat like the condylar inclination of the patient. Then we could organize the cusp height and the lingual surfaces of the anterior teeth so that they would be in harmony with the patient's movements. In this case, we are making an anterior bridge for this patient. And we are restoring the lingual concavities of the maxillary anterior teeth. And these are affected by the condylar inclination. So it would be important on this case to have somewhat the correct condylar inclination so that we can harmonize the lingual concavities of these anterior teeth. There are variables that can take effect or have effect within the posterior teeth. We have the plane of occlusion, which is a plane or a line drawn from the tip of the cusp which passes through the distal of the second molar. And this acts as a plane, and this is what we refer to as a plane of occlusion. Now within that plane, we have a curve that is formed by the individual cusp tips. And this curve we term the curve of speed. Now we can vary these, or these can uh, be varied in order to balance the occlusion, or in nature, as I will show in a clinical case, these can change to where they cause interferences in the posterior teeth. If we look at the plane of occlusion, this has an effect on the cusp height. The more divergent or the uh, further this plane of occlusion varies with the condylar inclination to the condylar inclination, the steeper the cusp can be. The more divergent the plane of occlusion is from the condylar inclination, uh, the steeper the cusp can be, or the more clearance we'll have in the posterior teeth. Now, as we raise the plane of occlusion, as represented here, the closer it becomes, or the more parallel it becomes to the condylar path, the shorter the teeth or the posterior cusp must be. So the higher the plane of occlusion, the less chance you're going to have for clearance, and the more interferences you're going to have in the posterior teeth. Now, if we look at the plane of occlusion, again, if we keep the condylar inclination the same and the anterior teeth the same, and we vary the plane of occlusion from here to here, we would have to shorten the cusp tips, or the higher the plane of occlusion, the shorter the cusp tips would be. As we said, within that plane of occlusion, there is also the curve of speed, which is formed by the cusp tip. Now, the steeper the curve of speed, or the shorter the radius of the curve of speed, the shorter the cusp tips must be. The shallower the curve of speed, the longer the cusp will be. Also, the shallower the curve of speed, the more your posterior teeth are going to clear. The steeper the curve of speed, with the condylar inclination staying the same, the more interferences you're going to have on the posterior teeth. Now, if we look at a clinical case again, we can see within this same patient a difference in the curve of plane of occlusion on either side of the arch. If we look at the posterior teeth, you can see that the plane of occlusion is much higher on this side of the mouth than it is on the opposite side of the mouth. This is within the same patient. This plane of occlusion is higher, as we say, or it's more parallel to the condylar inclination than this side. This side is more divergent from the condylar inclination on the, uh, that side of the patient. Let's look at the effect that we might have with these different planes. As we said, the higher the plane of occlusion, the more problems we are going to have in clearing out the occlusion. Say in a protrusive movement here, uh, it's going to be more difficult to separate these teeth with a given condylar inclination because the plane of occlusion is higher. 
Now let's watch the other side where the plane of occlusion is lower. And we would find that the posterior teeth separate much faster in a protrusive movement than when the plane of occlusion was higher. Also, this has a very dramatic effect on our balancing movements. We don't want the teeth, the posterior teeth, to contact in the balancing movement. The higher the plane of occlusion, the more interferences we're going to have. The shallower the plane of occlusion, you can see this side where the plane of occlusion is lower, we get more clearance between the posterior teeth. Or on the other side, the opposite side, where the plane of occlusion is higher, we get more balancing interferences or the teeth will clash. The natural dentition, when a tooth is lost, the adjacent teeth can tilt, as an example on this, these lower teeth, as the first molar was lost, the lower bicuspid uh, drifted back, and the molar drifted forward. And you get an exaggerated curve of speed in this lower arch. Also, the upper teeth came down into this area, giving us an exaggerated curve of speed. So for this individual, the condylar inclination stayed the same and the curve of speed increased. As a result of the increased curve of speed and the high plane of occlusion in relationship to the condylar inclination on this, this stayed the same the curve of speed changed, the, in, or the plane of occlusion changed, and we wind up with natural teeth then that can be in uh, interference or have interferences due to this exaggerated curve of speed. The balancing interferences and the protrusive interferences. How would we use this plane of occlusion and curve of speed in waxing up a case or in aiding us in causing the teeth to separate? could, in waxing the case, then decrease the curve of speed as we've done in this situation. We raise the lower teeth in the wax up and uh, shorten the upper teeth. We also drop the plane of occlusion so that it is a flatter plane of occlusion so that when we go into our protrusive movements, we got more separation of the posterior teeth and we go into our balancing movement, we have more separation of the posterior teeth. So the plane of occlusion can be used to aid in causing more separation between the posterior teeth. We can vary the plane of occlusion and curve of speed to also aid us in gaining a balanced occlusion. We're going to make an upper denture against this lower bridge work and there would be an advantage in having a balanced occlusion. We're using flatter plane teeth, so in order to get the teeth to balance, so they would contact when we go into protrusive, the anterior teeth contacting and the posterior teeth contacting, we could raise the plane of occlusion or increase the curve of speed to achieve a balanced occlusion, as you can see here. Also, this would give us contact as we moved into our lateral movements and we can use the curve of speed then and the plane of occlusion to give us a balanced occlusion. We saw the effect of varying the condylar inclination, the different condylar inclinations on the cusp height to the posterior teeth. We varied the plane of occlusion and the curve of speed and saw what effect it has on the cusp height. Now we want to see what effect the incisal guidance has on the posterior teeth. This is a normal horizontal overlap of the anterior teeth. In centric, the lower anterior teeth contact the lingual surfaces of the upper anterior teeth. So that in any movement, as soon as movement starts, the Guidance from the anterior teeth separate the posterior teeth. We have now increased the horizontal overlap between the incisal edges of the lower anterior teeth and lingual surfaces of the upper anterior teeth. 
we have increased the horizontal overlap of the anterior teeth. So now in a movement, we'd have to move horizontally before the tooth would contact the anterior teeth and then separate the posterior teeth. The more horizontal overlap that we would have between the teeth, the shorter the cusps of the posterior teeth must be. Or if we increase the horizontal overlap of the anterior teeth, we'd come into more interferences on the posterior teeth. In this situation, we keep the horizontal overlap constant and we increase the vertical overlap, or we increase the length of the tooth. And this would have the effect of when we moved in a protrusive movement, it would cause more separation between the posterior teeth. So the more vertical overlap that we have, the more, or the steeper the cusps can be on the posterior teeth. The more we, uh, vertical overlap we have, the more clearance we would have in our posterior teeth. If we decrease the amount of vertical overlap that we have on the anterior teeth or shorten the anterior teeth, we would find that we would lose our anterior guidance and instead of clearing, the posterior teeth would contact. So the, as you decrease the amount of vertical overlap, you need to shorten the cusps on the posterior teeth. So the less vertical overlap that you have, the shorter the cusps would have to be. On this diagram, we can see the effect of the vertical and the horizontal overlap of the anterior teeth. If we view this center picture, we see the normal amount of horizontal and vertical overlap of the teeth. If we uh, have this as the normal overlap, vertical overlap, we can have a longer cusp. If we move over to this one where we have shortened the amount of vertical overlap, you would see that we'd have to shorten again the posterior cusps or the cusps on the posterior teeth. If we viewed this as a normal amount of horizontal overlap and we increased the horizontal overlap, we would need to shorten the posterior uh, cusps of the teeth. If we increase the horizontal overlap, we also wind up with what we call a longer centric on the posterior teeth. Now the significance of this would be if uh, in an occlusal adjustment we were to grind on the lower anterior teeth. If you grind the incisal edges off of the lower anterior teeth, you have in effect increase the horizontal and the vertical overlap, both the horizontal and vertical overlap of the anterior teeth. And in effect, you have caused more interferences to occur on the posterior teeth. Therefore, we don't, do not grind or change the incisal edges of the lower anterior teeth. If we wanted to correct our errors, we'd grind on the lingual surfaces of the upper anterior teeth. There we could grind or change interferences that we would have in any one of the working, balancing, or protrusive movements. But if you grind on the lower incisors, you have, in effect, increased both the horizontal and vertical overlap, and you would need to shorten all the posterior teeth. The incisal guidance of the teeth must be protected. And that's why we have on the articulator what we call the incisal table. So that in order to protect the incisal guidance that we have from our teeth, when we mount the cast on the articulator, if these are in stone and we move the articulator a number of times in waxing up the case, then we would want to protect these surfaces so they wouldn't wear away. If we wore the surfaces away, we would be changing our guidance. So therefore, we have what we call the incisal table. And we set this incisal table so that the incisal pin rides on the incisal table and protects the incisal guidance. In this practical case, again, where we're restoring the anterior teeth, we would want to establish in here the normal amount of overjet and overbite so that we would, in effect, design our guidance of the anterior teeth so that it would clear the posterior teeth in protrusive movement and also the working and balancing movement. So we design our anterior guidance 
to separate the posterior teeth. The determinants of occlusion in the frontal plane can be observed as the patient moves into a working and balancing movement. The working movement is when the buccal cusps of the lower move over the lingual cusps or buccal cusps of the upper. That is the right hand side is in working movement, the left hand side in working movement, the left hand side is in balancing movement, and so on. Here the effect of the working condyle and the balancing condyle come into play. As we move into a balancing movement, balancing condyle moves downward, inward, and forward, and the working condyle may move straight laterally, laterally up and back, or laterally down. So this Movement in the frontal plane would take into consideration the effect of the working condyles in their different movements. If we view the schematic drawing of the teeth and the temporomandibular joints in the, in the frontal plane, we observe the contact relation between the teeth. We have the condyle in relationship to the the fossa, we have the space for the meniscus in between. We note here that this area is concave so that it can influence the lateral movements of the working condyle. If we view these movements of the working condyle, the working condyle has a potential of going straight laterally in a lateral movement. It can go laterally and down, or it can go laterally and up, and this would have a definite influence on the uh, teeth. So if we move laterally in a normal movement, we would find then that the teeth on this side are in a balancing or idling movement. This condyle is in a balancing movement. This condyle is in the working movement and these teeth are in their working relationship. Now, if we had a condyle, a working condyle, that went laterally and down, as it moved laterally, we would see that it would cause more separation between the posterior teeth. If we had a condyle that went laterally and down, we could have steeper cusps on the posterior teeth. If we had a working condyle that moved laterally and up, we could see the effect then on the posterior teeth. We would see that if the condyle moved laterally and up, we would find that the posterior teeth would clash. So if we had a condyle that moved laterally and up, we would have to have shorter cusps on the posterior teeth. If we could draw, view now this drawing from the textbook showing the effect of a condyle, working condyle, that moves laterally and inferiorly, or laterally and superiorly, we can see the effect on the cusp tips of the teeth. Here we have the condyle moving straight laterally, or it can move laterally and inferiorly, and laterally and superiorly. And this would be the effects that it would have on the working cusp, 
As it moved laterally and inferiorly, we could have a longer cusp. As it moved laterally and superiorly, it would shorten the cusp. And the same effect would be on the working cusp, or the balancing cusp. As you move laterally and inferiorly, you could have longer cusps. As you move laterally and superiorly, you would have to have shorter cusps. The lateral and movement of the working condyle also has an effect on the anterior teeth. If we have the same movements here of the working condyle moving laterally and then superiorly and laterally and inferiorly, we would see the effect on the anterior teeth. As the condyle moves laterally and superiorly, we'd have to have more concavity in the lingual surfaces of the anterior teeth. As it moved laterally and inferiorly, it would move away and we would have less lingual concavity in the anterior teeth. Movements in the frontal plane also involve the side shift of the working condyle. The effect on the cusp would be uh, if you had a cusp that was designed with less for a, a minimum amount of side shift and in reality the patient had uh, some side shift. If we make a lateral movement and watch the teeth we would see that the normal amount of side shift of the patient, the cusp would clear. Now, if we had designed a restoration on an articulator with a minimum amount of side shift, and we put it back in the mouth, and in reality the patient had some side shift, we would find that the teeth would clash. Or, if you increase the side shift, you should decrease the cusp height. So as you increase the side shift, you should decrease the height of the cusps. Now if we refer to the diagram from the book, we will see again the effect of the side shift on the cusp of the teeth. We have here different amounts of side shift of the mandible. And on the balancing side, we can see that as you, a slight amount of side shift or less slide sh side shift, you could have steeper cusps. As you increase the side shift, you need to decrease the size of the cusps. On the working cusp, it would be somewhat less, but still have an effect. The more side shift, the shorter the cusp would have to be. Now the practical applications of this again would be in the articulator that you used, as you can see here, there are no provisions in the condylar area to take into account the working condyle moving laterally up or laterally and down, or for the amount of side shift of the mandible. On the Hanau articulator that you're familiar with, you can see here that we do not have any provisions for an up and down movement of the working condyle. So this would not be taken into account on this articulator. We do, however, have provisions on the articulator for taking care of the amount of side shift. We can change the angulation of the condylar guides so that we can put into there different Bennett shifts, as you can see here. We can change the position of the condyle representing more or less side shift of the mandible. Sum, to summarize the determinants of occlusal morphology, there are certain determinants that affect the ridge and groove direction, and there are certain determinants that affect the maxillary teeth different than the mandibular teeth. Those determinants that cause the distal movement of the grooves, the working and balancing groove on the maxillary teeth, cause them to move distally would be the tooth being closer to the rotating centers, 
the tooth being closer to the midline, the greater intercondylar distance, less side shift, and a working condyle that goes laterally and posteriorly. Those determinants that cause the grooves to move measly on the upper teeth would be max, uh, working condyle that would move laterally and anteriorly. Those determinants that would cause the grooves to move distally on the mandibular teeth, this would be your balancing on the mandibular teeth, this would be the working movement on the mandibular teeth. Those determinants that would cause the grooves to move distally would be the tooth being closer to the center, uh, rotating center, the tooth being closer to the midline, having a greater intercondylar distance, less side shift, and a working condyle that would move laterally and anteriorly. Those factors that move the groove measurely on the mandibular teeth would be a working condyle that would move laterally and anteriorly. Those factors affecting the cusp height and the fossa depth would be the, the height of the cusps, how high the uh, cusp can be, and the depth of the fossa. Those factors that would cause a shortening of the cusp height would be a shallower condylar inclination, a greater horizontal overlap of the anterior teeth, less vertical overlap of the anterior teeth, more side shift, the occlusal plane being raised, an increase of the curve of speed, and a working condyle that would move out and up. You can increase the height of the cusp by a condyle, working condyle that moves out and down, and also by increasing the condylar inclination. Those factors that affect the lingual concavity of the maxillary anterior teeth, the lingual concavity that we talk about starts from our centric contact and is the area incisal to that. We would deepen or make shallower this lingual concavity. Those factors are those determinants that would cause an increase in the lingual concavity of the lingual surfaces of the maxillary anterior teeth are a steeper condylar inclination, a, an, inter, an increased in intercondylar distance, a condyle that moves laterally and up, a working condyle that moves laterally and anteriorly, and an increase in the, the side shift. You've been listening to a presentation from the University of Michigan School of Dentistry, which is dedicated to supporting open learning and open educational resources. This recording is licensed under the Creative Commons. It may be reused and redistributed for nonprofit use. Please attribute materials to the University of Michigan School of Dentistry and redistribute under this same license. For more information on how this and other University of Michigan School of Dentistry recordings may be used, visit www.dent.umich.edu license.